Trondheim is basically a company that was coming out of Trondheim in Norway. That's where it started. There were some big researchers who was working on these types of fungal infections and who developed a um, very nice set of genomic changes in those bacteria that are producing this chemical product. We were then listed on the NASDAQ First North in 2021, so it's only a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. We have a lot of Swedish investors. It's my first appearance, but it will not be the last one. So we have an affiliate in Norway, and that's where we do all our operational activities. We have an affiliate in Australia that has been running our phase one clinical trial. Um, and our manufacturers are split out in Europe. We have in Spain, we have in Sweden, and we have in Scotland, because there are three different processes in our manufacture. Our laboratories are also spread out. The main one is in Norway, but otherwise we outsource everything. And we only have that one active molecule called BSG005, where we're doing a lot of work also on new formulations and changing it to make it better. So this is where we started up. I'm going the wrong way. So what are we talking about? Who can get such an invasive fungal infection? The major point is that you have a weak immune system. Normal persons are exposed to, and all persons are exposed to, the spores of these fungi. And we breed them, they come in, and it doesn't matter, even in here, we have fungi spores. They are on surfaces, they are everywhere. But because we have a normal immune system, we can beat them. Only if you have a non-normal, a weak immune system, you are very high risk for such an infection. And this is particular when you look at, I have to find out of this one, um, when you look at patients who could be cancer patients in treatment with cytostatics of various kinds, it can be transplant patients that we know have to have something to keep the, the kidney or the liver or the lung in the patient. And, and these, pa these people have very often low immune resistance compared to a normal person. They have to. So therefore, these are the, the main patients, and, and the real thing is low immune function. And in fact is, patients who have cancer or, or have a transplantation, they very often die because of a fungal infection, not necessarily because of the operation and the transplantation. So what are we talking about globally? I was very surprised when I found these data. We are actually looking at something, oh, damn it, sorry. Mm. We are actually, the wrong way again, sorry about that, no, doesn't matter. We're talking about fungal infections worldwide and there's a lot of, of people in developing countries that actually get this disease and die from it. But it still surprised me very much that fungal infections of this kind actually is worse than many of these things. Also, many of these are, of course, Western diseases and so on, but it's still a very, very high number of patients uh, in this case here. We're talking about a few number, relatively few number of fungal pathogens that are attacking humans. There are hundreds, thousands of different fungi, strains all over the place, but only about 100 is prone to get into humans. So we're talking about typically something like called candidiasis, aspergillus, cryptococcus is, is worse in the developing countries, in the warm countries, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, not so much in, in the Western world. The main problem we have seen when we're talking about treatment of all these different ones, that's emergent resistance. I'm sure you've all heard of the last one called Candida auris. 
that's been in the media. It's a new multi-drug resistant fungal strain, which is spreading in the US. It makes a lot of noise, as it is right now. And then there's, of course, toxicity or adverse reactions from drugs that you are uh, treating these patients with. The challenge we are facing is really around diagnosing and, of course, treating these patients. Diagnosing is a problem. We don't have good enough test methods at the moment. They take too long, and they uh, may have to be followed up by resistance investigations as well. So some of it is simply not working clinically enough to be useful for the clinician. So very often they just have to, when they have a reasonable thinking about or understanding that there is an infection of this kind, just treat. Simply start treating. If you're lucky, you hit the right one. If you're unlucky, you have a couple of days extra. And uh, so this is really one of the biggest problems. That is how this is, how this is going to be improved. And what is BSG-005? I just mentioned briefly that it was our researchers in North, not our researchers, those that really started this up and did some fantastic work on changing the genomic of these bacteria. The goal they had at that point in time was less toxicity, if at least the same as the best drug we have on the market otherwise, and um, something that could save lives. They really were trying to get this up in, a, in the next league. And this is what we have been working on. What we know now is we don't have any genotoxicity. We have just in our phase one trial that's completed very short a time ago that we don't hit the kidneys, we also don't hit the liver, and we don't have some of the other side effects on, on body organs that we have seen from some of the uh, other products on the market. It works in a way that it binds to a, to a compound called ergosterol that sits in the cell wall of these fungi. When they attack these cell walls, they make small pores. And when you have a pore in a wall, things go out. Sometimes things go in. What it does is it kills the cell. No cell can survive that, that particular action. So that's what, why it is a very uh, strong new product that we are developing. The other thing is, it's a polyene macrolide. I'll come back to that, but a polyene macrolide, like our competitor on the market called Amphotericin B, they have been on the market for more than 50 years. Fantastic drug. It has its shortcomings in terms of kidney toxicity, uh, other laboratory investigations, that, so the patients have to get off sometimes. 30% of them. But it is a question of not producing resistance because they kill the fungus. So one of the things we see with, with our kind of products is that we don't produce resistance. It has taken more than 50 years to get the first things on amphotericin B to be resistant. And it's, that's really amazing. We test our product on cells, fungal cells, we call that in vitro testing. We have done that on a number of different fungi species. We have compared it with some of the other products on the market. Everything that is green on this slide is good. Everything that is orange is doubtful. Everything that is red is bad. So what we're looking at here is that basically the polyene macrolide class of drugs which are these ones, and only this one is on the market, of course, but we're all green, all green. And that's a big advantage for us, in the same way as we also know that we are fungicidal. BSG-005 and amphotericin B is fungicidal. It kills the fungus. Most of the other products only inhibit the growth, so it stays where it is, and they don't develop, and thereby uh, saves the patient at least for time. We also have investigated our product in animals. And this is from a mouse 
model where they are immunocompromised with cancer, uh, uh, chemotherapy drugs. They are infected and then we treat them for seven days and follow them for another 30, up to 30 days. We have done several experiments. One of them, and these are the two ones that I'll be talking about here, where we have used equal doses with amphotericin B slash ambisone, which is our, our, the main product on the market right now of this kind. And what we can see when we take the same dose level, that there is a four, three, four, five, four difference. In, in with our product, we have this kind of survivor. 90% of the mouse survive. With the amphotericin B at this dose level, it was down to, what is it, 40 or 30 percent, something like that. So it's a, it's a three-fold difference when we look at that. This was in Candida. We did it in Aspergillus, which is a slightly worse, not even a slight, it's, it's a much worse fungal strain to get infected by. And we have done the same experiment here, and because it's a little bit tougher to deal with, our survival is only 8, 60 percent, and the survival in the um, ambisone treated group is only 20%. So we see even in this difficult to treat one that we actually have a potency advantage. Somebody has come back to us and said, well, you did it in a low dose that's not relevant for ambisome amphotericin B. So we did the same experiment again where we also used several other products at clinical doses. What we did was we gave ambisome in the highest recommend no sorry in the yeah the highest recommended dose and also a starting dose, and as you can see when you compare it with our dose levels, this is about eight times higher for ambisome, eight times higher, and we still see like this in the class here and this is in candidiasis again, the big dose of ambisone has 100%, ours, eight times lower dose, has 90% survival. And similar on the next two dose levels, it's the same, and as you can see there, most of the others are even worse. So it, there is a potency advantage for BSG compared to ambisome and amphotericin B, which is the main we want to compare to. Ambisome had as I just mentioned, nephrotoxicity, kidney toxicity. It can destroy the kidneys. It, it goes in and it does something on the tubular levels in the kidney, and they, in worst case, the kidneys go down in kidney failure, and patients are really bad off in that sense. We have done this experiment where we look at an enzyme marker in the, from the kidney, and if it's damaged to the tubular material, this enzyme marker is excreted. And this is what we see, a steep increase in, in what we see of excretion of this one. And even if we go to very high doses, we don't see any difference. And this is what we have also shown in clinical trial, in the clinical phase one trial now. So this is basically a lot of what we have been talking about so far. I'll just skip that one. I have been telling you that we have just completed our phase one trial in healthy volunteers in Australia. <coughs> and we did that in a, in a trial that was double blind. We wanted to have some placebo in, so we had cohorts with six healthy volunteers on, in each cohort on each dose level. Four of the subjects were on BSG, two were on placebo trying to, what should we say, make sure that the adverse event profiles are correct. It's the only time we can do this. That's in healthy volunteers. If we're out in, in the real disease, you can't do it. Patients die, and we can't have them. So this is where we have, uh, as a study design, a single ascending dose where we just give them one dose one day, and then we take them out. And multiple ascending dose where we have seven days of dosing, on each dose level. And four of them are on active, two on placebo. 
And the objective was, of course, safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics is very typical in a phase one trial in healthy volunteers. In the single ascending, ascending dose, we saw in the four cohorts that we tested, up to one, 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram to be safe and well tolerated. Not one single SAE, serious adverse event, meaning bad. We didn't have one. We had quite a number of AEs, all of them being mild to moderate, including headache, dizziness, and similar things, easy to deal with, which we have also done and, and, and done in our MAD part. In the seven days dosing, we had two cohorts coming up to 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram. It was safe and well tolerated. No SAEs, no serious adverse events, similar type of ad ordinary adverse events, and so basically safe and well tolerated again. The reason why we couldn't go up to a similar dose as in the SAD was simply flevitis at the infusion site and vein. And if anybody, I don't know, it, it's technical. I'll try to do it very quickly. When you infuse such a product, whether it's a cytotoxic, can be any kind of antibiotic, you infuse that. There is a risk that it will irritate the inside of the vein. Then it gets thick and a little bit inflamed, not infected, inflamed, and it gets red and it hurts. That was the reason why the doctors in Australia didn't want to continue with a higher dose. Not because of adverse events or serious adverse events, not at all, it was only phlebitis. So in total, what we have seen is, we have no serious adverse events. We had 24 healthy volunteers through the study, and uh, all of it was safe and well tolerated. So we have and nothing on the kidney, nothing on the liver, nothing on potassium in the blood samples and so on. All the things that we were looking for were okay. So it is well tolerated. We know what the exposure is in, in these volunteers. So we know where we are when we get uh, onto the next level. So it was major progress for us. Coming through a phase one in healthy volunteers with your drug is a major milestone for any drug development. So right now, Biogen has a new antifungal drug in clinical phase two. And we have that because we are planning this one. Basically, we have a phase two program that is, in, that is containing one phase two A problem, uh, clinical trial, and then two to three phase two B clinical trials. And what we're looking for here is an open study. It's in patients who are in need for treatment with a polyene, um, uh, polyene drug like amphotericin B. We are not on the market, so we can't use it officially put in that way. What we're looking for in this one is to take those patients who have an invasive fungal infection diagnosed, have been treated with products, and now need to have amphotericin B, and gets it, but fails on it because of toxicity. We're talking again about primarily the kidney, potentially the liver, and some of the other things. This is potassium in the blood, which is bad for the heart if it moves up or down. It doesn't, either way is bad. So th this is a very specific population, but it's basically somebody who does not have any chance for other real treatments. They don't have anything else. So what we're going in with is uh, where we treat them with a starting dose from our phase one in healthy volunteers, do that, and then we increase the dose level every three days. And we watch, of course, the safety. That's always the primary issue, but I'm really interested in efficacy. I want to see if we can help these patients, get them through their infection, maybe even cure them, not cure them, but make them, make them good again. That's my goal with this one. 
And if we can do that, then we are, in my best opinion, we have open doors, both for more patients that should be using amphotericin B, but also from other treatments where they can't tolerate treatment or don't get an effect of it. That's, that's where we're coming from. You know? Yeah, I know I have. We're running out of time. Yeah, so I can, know. You, can you please wrap it up? I can. Yes. I, I can. Give you one minute, please. That's okay. BSG005 is a new <coughs> gene edited product. It kills fungus. It is safe and well tolerated. Don't do what many other drugs do to the patients. And if we can succeed in just hitting this one trial that I'm telling you, I think we have a very good case. We have, prom we have given what we promised a long time ago, and we are giving it again with these things. So BSG05 is here to stay. Thank you very much.